And we are now arrived at our last invited speaker of the day. And uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Jeff D, who works with me uh, at Google. Jeff uh, has been at Google for uh, more than 15 years now. He has basically invented all the cool infrastructure we have at Google that includes MapReduce, uh, that includes Bigtable, the protocol buffers, and, and the list is very long. But recently, he decided to revolutionize uh, deep learning as well, at least at scale. <laughs> And so he, together with others, he created a big group where I work with him. And I think he's going to talk about that now. Yeah. Uh, so thank you. Um, so yes, as Sammy said, this is uh, joint work with our team, the Google Brain team, and a bunch of other teams at Google. Um, and one of the things I'd like to stress is how pervasive these kinds of techniques have become over the last few years. We started a few years ago just kind of exploring how these kinds of models could be used in a few different domains. And over time, what we found is that more and more teams have been uh, sort of amenable to trying these ki kinds of techniques and getting very good results, and then using them in their actual products. And we've also been doing a lot of interesting research that is not necessarily designed to influence products today, but sort of down the road, if we can solve these problems, we know that would be generally useful. And so you can see a fairly steep ramp in the number of directories that contain sort of model description files. It's a proxy for how many different people or teams are using uh, these kinds of systems. And it's pretty pervasive across you know, a bunch of different domain areas at Google. Um, so the outline of the talk that I'm going to give today is to describe a little bit about the different kinds of infrastructure we've built to help us in doing deep learning research. Basically, we systems that allow us to train on large data sets at scale, to turn around experiments quickly. And I'll describe two, two different generations. The first is disbelief, which we wrote about uh, in NIPS 2012. And I'll describe a little bit about a second generation system we've been putting together that we think is uh, cleaner and nicer based on what we've learned in building and using the first generation system. Uh, and then I'm going to give an overview of kind of some of the ways in which we do research at Google. So we sort of find a thread and then figure out different ways in which that thread of research can influence different kinds of things. Uh, and then finally, I'm going to conclude with a new approach for training, but it's for people, not models. Um, so as I said, the project started in 2011. Uh, actually, Andrew Ng was spending a day a week at Google, and I bumped into him in a micro kitchen. And I said, oh, what are, what are you working on? And he said, neural nets. I, I'd actually done a, a thesis as an undergrad on parallel training of neural nets uh, back in the sort of first grand era of neural nets. And uh, they were, I thought, a really interesting abstraction for these kinds of problems, but they were sort of not computationally ready at that time. They sort of would do interesting things on small data sets, but uh, I kind of moved on and I did all kinds of other stuff. But I have returned because I believe in this model. Um, and we had a big emphasis when we started the project on using large data sets and large amounts of computation to see what we could really do if we kind of push the boundaries in these two directions. Uh, there's no shortage of interesting data sets uh, across lots of different kinds of domains. And I think that's kind of one of the most interesting things about these problems is that often you can fuse data from different kinds of domains. The talk we, we just heard about fusing different kinds of sensor data in cars, for example, is a great example where these models learn how to integrate all those kinds of information in a very sort of uh, cohesive and end-to-end -end trained way. Um, so how can we build systems that really can take advantage of this raw data? Um, you know, there's lots of different things you'd want to do. If you had images, you'd want to be able to like localize objects and tell what they are. And this is obviously hard because the bottom three things are all tractors, but they look completely different. But we as humans can easily tell that those are, those are tractors. Uh, you know, you have a bunch of more specialized kind of visual tasks. You want to be able to find house addresses, and they all look completely different in the world. Uh, you know, some are slanted and colored, and uh, you want to be able to read them. That can help us improve our maps. Uh, more generally, we'd like to be able to see, take kind of cluttered scenes like this and first find all the text in the scene, then read it and understand it, and use that to kind of help people understand the world around the physical world around them. Um, you know, text understanding is another big thing that we care about deeply. Uh, if you just read this paragraph, you know that's a terrible review of this movie. But it has lots of positive -y sounding words. OK, looks good. I was in awe. Uh, and it's actually a little bit hard to tell as a human that this is kind of a pretty negative sentiment. So understanding the true meaning of all these words and paragraphs and sentences in the world is a pretty, pretty uh, ambitious but important task. 
Um, there's a really nice property that neural nets have. Uh, the re results tend to get better if you have more data and you can use a bigger model to capture the kind of more subtle patterns that occur in that data. And obviously to do that, you need more computation. Uh, of course, better algorithms and new insights and better techniques always help too. Uh, and you need all these things in order to really make progress. Um, so one of the things we've been focusing on a lot in our work is good turnaround time for experiments. There's a very different feel. You know, uh, when you use a slow compiler and you're writing software, it's very frustrating compared to when you're using a fast compiler. And this is sort of the same kind of thing. You want turnaround time for experiments you're doing to be measured in minutes and hours. That's a very different feel than even something that's you know, a few days kind of turnaround time. And that's even another level of, of uh, productivity over something that takes many weeks. And if it's many months to do an experiment, you're basically, you're not gonna even make any progress because you, you have to run so many experiments in parallel and they're like, ah, oh, what was that experiment I started four months ago? It's now ready and baked and I, I can't even remember. So we focus a lot on techniques that get us really good turnaround time on these experiments. Uh, maybe a good catchphrase is train it a day, what would take a single GPU card six weeks? That, that's kind of a good motto because the day turnaround time or even half day feels qualitatively different. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things we started looking at is how can we parallelize these kinds of training processes? And clearly there's lots of parallelism to exploit in neural nets. Um, I'll talk about two kinds, model parallelism and data parallelism that we use all the time both uh, independently and also in conjunction with each other. So model parallelism is basically this idea that you have some sort of deep network. Uh, maybe it's a convolutional one, so you have local receptive fields. Uh, and that's kind of nice, especially if you're going to partition this model. So the idea is we're going to partition this model across a bunch of machines or maybe a bunch of devices or maybe a bunch of devices on a bunch of different machines and then allow those partitions to sort of uh, do the computation in parallel. And uh, that's very helpful because now you can sort of dramatically speed up the time it takes to run a single batch of examples through one of these models. Um, the second kind of parallelism is a little more subtle and finicky to use, but is uh, somewhat easier to scale. So the idea is you're going to have a bunch of replicas of your model. You're going to have them reading independent data examples. Uh, so they sort of have partition the data. And you're going to have a set of parameter servers that are going to keep track of the current state of your model. And one of these replicas will download the current set of parameters for the model. It will process a mini batch of examples. So it might process you know, 100 images or 1,000 images, compute some gradient for uh, the adjustments it'd like to make to the model. It won't apply the adjustments locally. Instead, it'll send them to this centralized service, which might itself be spread over hundreds of machines or tens of machines. And that service will apply this update. It'll do new parameters equals the old parameters plus the, the gradient. Um, and then before the next batch of examples, this model replica will essentially do the same thing and we'll get a, it can be another up parameter update and that'll get applied. And what's really happening is all of these replicas are applying these updates uh, independently. So you can either do this asynchronously where there's no synchronization between the model replicas and that can cause a bit of issue in that the gradients each model replica computes may have been to the original set of parameters that it got and they, those parameters may have moved in the meantime because other asynchronous replicas have said, oh, please move the parameters over here. Um, or you can do this more synchronously where essentially, so if you do it synchronously, you have a bunch of replicas uh, all in lockstep fashion getting the parameters. So they all get the same set of parameters and then you, they each apply a mini batch of size n. So now you have n replicas and n times the batch size as one replica. And the nice thing is you don't get any noise from this asynchrony uh, because it's all completely synchronous, but it's a bit less false to fault tolerant. Basically, if any of those replicas die, you have to essentially do some recovery and, and the, the whole system kind of needs to deal with that. Um, or you can do it asynchronously, as I showed in the previous slide, where there's no synchronization and you get noise in the gradients that you might think would be very disruptive, but it turns out it generally kind of works and you can get anywhere from kind of 10 to 1,000 independent replicas working asynchronously on updating uh, the parameters in the model, kind of depending on the structure of the model. Sparser models 
where only some of the parameters are touched by any given set of examples tend to be more at the 1,000 range, and dense ones tend to be more at the kind of 10 to 100 replicas. Uh, you can also do a hybrid of this, of course, where you have M asynchronous groups of N synchronous replicas. There's a whole sort of sliding scale between this. Um, so one of the things that's uh, an important consideration here is if you're trying to share the set of parameters between a bunch of model replicas, uh, you want the computation time for the model to be large relative to the amount of time it takes you to transfer these, these parameters over your network. Um, so models that with fewer parameters that reuse every parameter multiple times in the computation tend to do better. Um, one level of reuse you get is through mini-batching. So if you download the set of parameters and then you process a batch of size b, you're effectively reusing every parameter at least b times in, in that example. Um, but certain kinds of model structures that are uh, actually very successful to these days, uh, including convolutional models and recurrent models, tend to reuse each parameter many times across the same example as well. So in addition to that batch size factor of b, you get, for example, convolutional models might reuse the same uh, convolutional filter in hundreds or thousands of, of different spatial positions in, a, in an image. And that gives you like another factor of 1,000 reuse of that parameter. Uh, recurrent models, you tend to unroll through time, maybe 50 or 100 steps or something. And that gives you a factor of 100 reuse of the a set of dense LSTM parameters in, in an LSTM. So there's, we've observed this trend internally of focusing on model types that tend to have um, fewer parameters and reuse those parameters more. Uh, I don't know if that's because we're doing lots of distributed training, and so those tend to work better in that kind of setup, but that is an observation that we've, we've been making. For example, the, the latest image model that we've been using has about 6 million parameters, even though it's much more accurate than one we were using a few years ago that had about 60 million parameters, because we've essentially removed the fully connected layers, which had a ton of parameters that were all reused only, only once, per example and replace them with convolutional parameters. OK, so now let me take you through a thread of research uh, that, uh, and how it kind of has evolved over the past couple of years uh, in the different uh, directions uh, and how it can be sort of reused in other scenarios. So sequence-to-sequence -sequence models uh, were originally developed by uh, Oriol Vignoles, Elias Lutzkever, and Kwok Lee in our group looking at basically a general framing of a problem where you want to take a sequence and map that to another sequence. Now that sounds kind of abstract, but it turns out this kind of problem crops up all the time, right? Basically, uh, you can take a sequence and then map that to a high dimensional vector. So the representation of that sequence that's been consumed so far, you can view as some point in high dimensional space. And Typically, we use deep LSTMs to process the elements of this time sequence in order to construct the high dimensional representation. And this high dimensional representation might be you know, 4,000 activations of a bunch of different LSTM layers. Um, so if you connect these two things, you can actually get a machine translation system. That was kind of the first use that uh, Ilya, Oriel, and Quack put to this sequence to sequence model. Essentially, you read in English, you get a representation of the English sentence, and then you train the model to start with that representation and spit out the corresponding French. Um, so that's kind of cool. Uh, and it works well. It's actually better than state of the art uh, at the time this was published. Um, and there's been a bit of follow on work about how to deal with rare words in the, these uh, kinds of models that you can find in an archive. Um, so you can actually connect this slightly differently or use different data essentially and get a chat bot. So uh, basically we, uh, Oriol uh, had the idea I think of, of taking our internal text, op, uh, text chat logs. So we have this system where you can say, my laptop's not working, uh, can you help me? And so here's an example. We call it BrainStop instead of TechStop. Uh, hi, I have a problem with my machine. Hi, hi, this is Shiva, how are you doing today? So the blue is what the model generated. Um, hi, how are you? I'm fine, thanks. Uh, how may I assist you today? I want to access using VPN. And then the model knows enough to ask a follow-up question. You know, currently, is it connected to the corp network? No. And then check this solution. And then it spits out a URL. Um, and they say, thanks, bye. And BrainStop says, thank you. And off it goes. 
Um, so that shows you that these things really are understanding fairly long-term context in the sort of sequence of data that they're, they're processing. Um, uh, Oriel then focused on using this for parsing. So the idea is you want to take an arbitrary sentence and then generate a parse tree. And you can encode the parse tree as another kind of sequence. Um, and that works pretty well. Uh, and that's going to be in NIPS this year. Um, and the neat thing is it's a completely learned parser with no parsing specific code, right? Essentially trained on the output of a, of a state-of-the-art parser. And then we can uh, actually do better than, than that state-of-the-art parser. <clears throat> Um, another th kind of cool thing you can do is feed in a bunch of points and then train the system to generate a bunch of graphical properties of those points. So for example, you can feed in a bunch of points and have trained the model to output the convex hull of, of, from that set of points. It's a subset of the points that form the convex hull. Or you can do a Delaunay triangulation or a traveling salesman tour. Uh, and these actually work reasonably well. Um, so that's kind of cool. From that one basic sequence to sequence model, you can sort of massage your input data or massage the kind of problem you're trying to solve. Uh, this one actually had a little bit of tweaks to the model to allow it to refer back to other points in a slightly different way. But basically, these kinds of, of directions are sort of this meandering tour you have in, in a research space of how can we really deal with sequences and understand them well. Um, so obviously, there's been really big improvements in object recognition over time uh, using CNNs. So um, this is sort of top one accuracy for ImageNet. And um, the, as I said, the latest model that uh, was developed at Google by a bunch of uh, uh, vision researchers essentially replaced all the fully connected layers that had been being used in kind of the state-of-the-art models with just more convolutions. So you just had more convolutions. And um, now uh, one of the things is that at every layer, you have convolutions of different sizes that can pick up on, on sort of smaller or bigger patterns at that level of representation. And these models actually are really good at giving good fine-grain classifications. So they're actually better than human in some cases. I would say flower, but you know, it, it, it does better than that. Um, you know, they're good at generalizing. These things have no <clears throat> real pixels in common in some sense. They're both very different looking things, but you'd want to call them both a meal, probably. Uh, they make kind of sensible errors, right? Like it's sort of understandable that you might say snake for that. Um, I know that's not a dog. I actually had to look closely to tell if it was a goat or a donkey. And I'm, it might be one of each. I'm not really sure. What do we think? Donkey? Yeah, it's a little hard to tell. That's the whole point. Um, and so you know, we've been working with a number of product teams to actually take these kinds of systems that can do a pretty good job of recognizing what's in, what's in actual uh, images just from the raw pixels and deploying them in different ways. So one of the ways that we can deploy this is essentially allow users to search their photos uh, without tagging them. And so this is a public post a user made. And he said, wow, this is really cool. I didn't tag these. And I was able to find my statue photos. Um, and another user said, wow, I could find my drawings. That's cool. And I, I was pretty happy that it found a macrame Yoda, because <laughs> that's not like most other Yodas you see. Um, you know, For that cluttered street scene, one of the first tasks is to be able to find the text in the street scene. Uh, this is work that. Uh, my summer intern from a couple years ago, Matt Zeeler, did uh, uh, in conjunction with some of the people in the Street View team to basically find text in raw images. And you know, you can see that it's fine. It, you know, it's doing a good job of finding, you know, uh, text in different character sets. Um, and there's actually some text in that window that's pretty hard to pick up on, but it's in an unlit neon sign. Uh, you know, you're seeing things in all kinds of different fonts and in different sizes and scales, and these things. Uh, actually just work quite well. Um, so you can actually take the sequence to sequence model and rip off the first sequence thing and instead initialize the state of the model with the output of a convolutional network. And so you can essentially take pixels in, form some internal state, and then use that to try to generate a human level caption. So given training data of the form, you know, picture and a sentence about the picture, the model can actually absorb the pixels generate a representation that is really good at generating what a plausible caption might be. 
And so, for example, you see this is a, a test image that is never seen before, and it generates that sentence. Um, and it's actually a generative model. So uh, on the same image, I've seen it also generate a, a close-up of, a, of a, a child and a, and a teddy bear or something. So it, it generates multiple sort of plausible sentences about the same image. Uh, and that works pretty well. Uh, you know, considerable improvements over previous state-of-the-art. Um, and that was a CVPR paper. Uh, here's a couple more examples. You know, when it fails, it's kind of amusing. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I, if you squint just right, I'm sure you can see the, the man <laughs> flying through the air riding the snowboard. Um, and you see in the upper left that it kind of knows that tennis is going on, but it doesn't know that the person is serving, right? A human would probably give a more specific kind of of uh, description than a man holding a tennis racket. That is true, but it's not particularly interesting. And there are three kinds of pizza on the stove, but it's all right. Um, OK, so let me switch gears again and tell you about a system called TensorFlow. So TensorFlow is kind of uh, the new system we've built for doing all of our research and our production training of deep neural nets. Um, essentially, it's we've taken the lessons from the first system we built. Uh, the motivations essentially were the first system was really good for scalability and for production training of all kinds of models. Like if you wanted to train a network that had basic feed forward and then feed backward for gradient pass kinds of things and was a standard fairly plain vanilla thing, maybe with convolutions or an LSTM, it was great for that. If you wanted to do something more exotic like kind of weird reinforcement learning where you do a bit of uh, extra magic to generate your gradient, and it's not a simple up-down thing. It was not as flexible as we wanted. So what we really want is a system that has the scalability and production readiness properties of, dis of disbelief, our first system, but was much easier to express models in, much more flexible for research purposes. And so this better understanding of what we're actually should, should be building allowed us to make a bunch of dramatic simplifications in the system as well. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about that. So, the first part of TensorFlow is the execution core that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and there's very low overhead. It's essentially a system that takes computational graphs and executes them. Um, and there's different ways that you can specify those computational graphs. Um, and we're working on sort of additional ways of enabling sort of reusable modules for uh, making this even easier. Uh, right now, we have Python and C++ front ends that allow you to specify the graph in uh, those two different languages. We expect more languages to be added down the road. We've had some interest internally at Google for Go front ends, for example. Um, and so I'll, this is a lot of code for a slide. I just want to kind of give you a flavor of the kinds of things you would specify in a TensorFlow model. So typically, the first thing you do is you say, I want to import the TensorFlow library. This is the Python front end. You say, I want a new graph. Then you say, I have some examples, and I've already loaded them in some data set here. Uh, I have some labels that I've also already loaded. And then I create a couple of weight matrices, variable uh, w, which is rows by columns by number of labels. And then I create a bias thing, which is just the number of labels. Uh, this, is, this model is going to do batch logistic regression, so not very deep. But it had to fit on a slide. So uh, uh, the real uh, deep neural net would be like 10 more lines of code or something. Uh, and then I'm going to compute some logits. I'm going to have a loss. And then I'm going to use a particular optimizer to optimize that loss. And that's essentially what you say to specify the model. And that gives you a computational graph. Um, and then you can say, OK, now with this graph, create a session for my computational engine. And I want to initialize all my variables first. So that's going to run some initialization statements for those variables. Uh, like you see that truncated normal, that's going to initialize that W matrix with uh, a bunch of normal di normally distributed numbers. And then I say for step in number of steps, run the graph and run it up to the optimizer and loss part of the graph. That's essentially all I do. And then I repeatedly do that. And every so often, I'm going to print the step and the loss. So a pretty much wholly self-contained example. I didn't show you how to load the training in uh, data set and labels, but other than that, it's pretty much complete. Um, and so the computation you get is a data flow graph. And so you have graph of nodes. These we call operations or ops. You know, we're kind of haven't settled on a single name. 
Uh, and everything that flows along the graph edges are tensors, so arbitrary n-dimensional arrays. Um, and we've added notions of state to the model. So variables are stateful. Uh, so biases is a variable, for example. And then there's a bunch of graph computations that are stateless. And then there's a minus equals operation that's going to update the biases. Um, and right, so some, some nodes are stateful. Most are stateless. Uh, it's also distributed. So we can take that graph that is an arbitrary specification, and then we can map that onto multiple different devices. So if I have just a CPU with a bunch of cores in it, that's fine. That's just uh, very easy to map. If I have a GPU card in my machine plus a CPU, the system might decide to put some of the computation on the GPU because it thinks that'll be faster, and then put other computation, maybe we don't have a GPU implementation for some of it, on the CPU. And it'll take care of moving the data between these different devices. Uh, if we have a big distributed system, the same thing will happen. It'll map the computation onto the set of devices on all the machines we have and insert the appropriate kind of communication between uh, elements in the graph to move data around. Um, and the user can also specify hints, like I would really like this, op I need this operation on a GPU, or I really want this on machine one and this on machine two. Uh, okay. Uh, we also can run this same graph on, uh, say, a mobile phone, which is a nice property. You can essentially move from you know, a big production training environment in a data center to running that model for inference purposes on a phone. Uh, ah, in fact, that's what that slide says. Uh, right. I don't need to say more. Um, so one of the things we really like about this model is it's quite flexible. right? Uh, so all the deep learning kinds of things that we have built are a library on top of that core set of graph execution primitives. Um, we, think it's, we, it, we know it's also useful for other, some other kinds of machine learning algorithms. We think it's a fairly general purpose framework that could be used for a lot of different kinds of sort of numerically intensive computations. And the thing, another thing that's nice is it abstracts away the underlying devices and computational hardware you have a bit. Uh, you can give hints where needed, but you don't have to. Uh, it's also extensible, so we have a whole bunch of primitives implemented for things like matrix multiply and you know, ReLU and things like that, but you can extend it with additional operations and kernels um, uh, for you know, your particular thing that maybe isn't as easy to support in uh, you know, the current set of primitive operators. Um, and you, so we use TensorFlow for neural nets all the time. Uh, Basically, we're in this transition phase where every project that is using disbelief is essentially migrating to using this system. All of our new research is being done in this. Uh, and uh, essentially, a typical neural net layer, in some sense, maps to one or more tensor operations. Uh, and then we have a whole bunch of libraries of these kinds of operations that are specialized for, for neural nets. So we have convolutions and pooling and softmax and different kinds of losses and different optimizers. Um, one of the things we have, similar to Theano, is automatic differentiation, which uh, has been a big uh, help. It makes it a lot easier to figure out how to, uh, you know, you can just say, I, this is the loss I want to optimize, and off it, off it goes. Um, so we found this pretty easy to experiment with a lot of different kinds of models and to kind of flexibly, in the like sequence to sequence work that I was showing you, it's pretty easy to like stitch an image model together with an LSTM for doing sequence prediction and try all kinds of weird combinations like that, and to do so quickly, so training that quickly. Um, another simplification we were able to make is, unlike disbelief, which had kind of this separate parameter server notion, we just have stateful nodes in the graph, and the job is to map the computation onto the set of devices that you want to use, possibly with some hints for the user. So this is like a graph where you've replicated the computation that you care about three times, so you have three replicas, and this is asynchronous. So each one of those graphs can be driven independently without any synchronization between them. If you want to do synchronous training, you construct almost the same graph, except you synchronously drive the graph. You run the computation uh, through three copies of the model, each on different examples. So now your batch size is kind of three times as big. And you add up the gradients, and then you update the parameters. So it's very flexible in this way. You could easily do the M of N hybrid things where you have you know, three groups of these that are synchronous, that are uh, themselves asynchronous. Um, OK, on to training. So 
Uh, one of the things that uh, we found is that this area is very exciting. There's a lot of really interesting work being done in both kind of the perceptual domains and in language understanding domains. Uh, Trevor's talk earlier on robotics, you know, connecting these things to kind of real world robotic systems, I think is really interesting. There's tons of interesting stuff going on. Um, and we're always looking for people that are uh, wanting to learn about this area and to do re great research in this area. Um, so uh, because there hasn't, this resurgence of deep learning has sort of only happened in the last few years, there haven't been a lot of sort of uh, formal curriculum except in a, a limited number of academic institutions. So one of the things we've decided to try as a bit of an experiment is uh, what we're calling the Brain Re Google Brain Residency Program. Uh, so basically, it's a one-year immersion program in doing deep learning research. Uh, and the idea is you're going to work with research scientists and our team to perform independent research. Uh, you get a, it's a real job with a one-year employment, fixed term, salary and benefits. And the goal after that one year is to have people in the program to have conducted several, several different research projects. You know, one of the things that's great about summer internship programs is we bring in all these people with new ideas. And what we often find is that three months is just kind of short, right? Like by the time they kind of get up and running and really get sort of rolling on their project, the summer is over. And kind of this, I think, is a much, uh, I mean, internships are still great. But I think a one-year thing really will allow people to get a lot more experience and to get uh, a lot more sort of productive research done. Uh, and another nice thing is we have interesting problems, of course. Uh, the TensorFlow system I just described is, you know, uh, the, basically the thing we're using for all of our research, and we have a bunch of computers. Um, so the kinds of people we're imagining would apply are people with a bachelor's and master's in computer science, probably, but math or statistics, fine, you know, understand math, programming experience, and People are really interested in sort of learning how to do research in, in deep learning. Uh, there's more, info oh, the timeline. Uh, applications are open. This is the first public announcement of this. So uh, today, we are accepting applications until January 15th. Uh, <laughs> it, it roughly coincides with like grad school application timelines. Um, and uh, we're going to sort of get a bunch of applications, we hope, and review them in kind of January and maybe do interviews of some form, phone calls, maybe GV, uh, video conferencing, or maybe on-site interviews from people who are local, and then make a decision on people in the program and accept the first cohort of people. And then the program would start in early June. So that's kind of it. There's more information there. g.co slash brain residency, or you can send us email. Um, I'll leave that up for a moment. And that's all I have. So I will take questions. So we have plenty of time of question. Yes? Uh, uh, Mike. Can you do loops with TensorFlow? I'm sorry? Can you do loops? Yes. So we do have a, uh, a handful of control flow primitives. Uh, that uh, we've added, um, they're less fully utilized. Like, we haven't been using them very much, so we don't have a lot of internal experience, but we have the control flow primitives in the system. And we were sort of learning how they're useful and when it makes sense, for example, to use loops rather than unrolling an LSTM uh, uh, for training. Isabel. Is TensorFlow a completely in-house system, or are you going to open it up to the public? Uh, TensorFlow is, is in-house. We've, we've ha our interns who have come and then have left are somewhat sad to have left. Uh, so we're, we're pondering uh, what to do, but we don't have anything to, to announce. Other questions for Jeff? Yes, there's one mesh. So one of the things that interests me is not just how we identify stuff or solve problems, but also how we fail and how we know we failed and what we do then. So for example, the street recognition, you know, 
I would look at it, say, okay, it's a street. Oh, wait, there's a lot of New York in there. So it must be New York, right? And then I would try to narrow it down. Is it Manhattan? Is it Bronx? Um, so I'm curious whether you see yourself going in that direction. Or is this, is this something that you're working on? Is that something you've thought about? The, the problem of understanding how, the model, how these kinds of models fail in various ways, is that um, what you Knowing that you have failed. Knowing that you failed, and then if you have failed, understanding why. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think um, there's a bit of interesting work about having models also emit confidence levels. So are, how confident are you in this response? I think that's certainly a, an interesting direction. Uh, in terms of when you do fail, understanding why, it's sort of for human uh, understanding so that you can sort of improve the model or understand the general kinds of mistakes it's making. I think that's a pretty active area of research. We have a number of people on our team who are working on visualizations and other kinds of sort of debugging uh, systems for understanding the internal structure of models, particularly for this example, you know, what kinds of things are, are uh, what patterns are being picked up on in this example that are causing it to be wrong or right. Uh, I think that's a pretty, pretty interesting area that will be fruitful for research you know, for many years down the road. Because these, these models are not going away. They're becoming much more important and prevalent. And they're going to be trained to do more end-to-end -end kinds of actions, you know, drive the car's accelerator directly from visual inputs and that kind of thing, as the previous talk was just discussing. And I think it's, it's really important to understand what kinds, of, what kinds of properties these models have. Does the end, uh, Mike? Uh, can you Mike. comment on? <laughs> Uh, can you comment on what kind of optimization algorithm you use for distributed training over multiple nodes? So let's say you have a node with multiple GPUs. That's pretty easy to parallelize. Right. But when you go over multiple nodes, what kind of uh, methods do you use? Uh, sure. So, you, uh, so, I mean, I think there's no one answer, unfortunately. It kind of depends on the model structure. Um, you know, for models with kind of embeddings of kind of things like textual entities or query words or things like that, you know, we'll tend to use Atagrad because that tends, those tend to have the, case, the property that you see some examples or some particular words a lot and some not so often. And so the Atagrad properties where sort of the natural uh, center of mass of a embedding sort of stays a bit more fixed for things after you update it a bunch of times is a kind of a nice stabilizing property for the models. Uh, we also use a lot of just standard SGD with momentum kind of things. <laughs> Oh, how do we distribute? Uh, so uh, in TensorFlow, it's a lot more flexible because we have the ability to, for example, insert additional aggregation nodes, say, within a machine boundary before we send data over the network. Uh, and so um, you uh, can essentially do like the synchronous replicas maybe within a, a machine for a bunch of GPU cards and then have a, a bunch of asynchronous copies of that as one possible variant. But it really depends on the particular model and you know how much how much hardware you want to throw at it in order to get uh, the the uh, the training time down. If you if you don't care about training time, it's more efficient to just use a single GPU card, but typically that's untenable for big problems. Well that's kind of why I was asking the questions because uh, you don't get that much of a speed up you don't get that much of a speed up if you, if you go across nodes. Um, you know, it's not like you can use something like 100 nodes and get a significant speed up unless it depends uh, there on is your a network. breakthrough in algorithms. No, but let's say you train a fairly large ConvNet. Which no, no, I mean, I mean your, your computer network. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on your computer network. Well, of course it does, but, but, but it also depends on your algorithm a lot. So you know, if, let's say you use InfiniBand or something like that, um, and you have, I don't know, you know a rack full of... Uh, of nodes with you know four GPUs each, which is you know what we can build nowadays. Um, like, how do you distribute the optimization over multiple nodes? That's a big question. It's an unsolved problem. You know, it, you can tell yes. us it's unsolved. Uh, yes. Uh, well, I mean, obviously, it's clearly not completely solved. But there's, um, you know, we would basically distribute the set of parameters in that model across a bunch of the nodes, and have each model replica get sort of gather the current set of parameters, process some examples. Uh, aggregate the gradients locally if possible and send them back, you know, and then send back the little bits for the different parts of the, the parameters. Right, which 
doesn't scale very well with more than a few nodes, basically. It depends on the model structure, but yeah. There's someone in the back. Is TensorFlow fault tolerant at all? Does it checkpoint itself? Does it have any other fault tolerance? Yes, it uh, does checkpointing. Uh, and you can control how often that happens. Um, saving the model state and restoring it is actually just another little piece of the graph on the side that you can choose to execute every so often, um, which is kind of a nice property. It's not like a completely separate code path in the system. It's just some graph execution where you happen to be executing save ops and restore ops. Um, and uh, We've thought a little bit about making nodes fault tolerant by periodically replicating them to memory of other, of other processors. So you could take a parameter matrix and have multiple copies of it that you keep loosely in sync. Uh, we haven't actually uh, explored that too much, but that's probably a cheaper way than checkpointing. Uh, hi. Uh, uh, great talk. So you have shown that uh, you feed images, it generates descriptions, and then you have the chatbot. Uh, so, you know, how far are they to really a sophisticated sort of experience? For example, you know, when the scene description, when you compare it with a professional, you know, writer actually, when you look at the video and then write to the screenplay, and uh, also the kind of the chatbot, when you're kind of carry out an intelligent conversation, right? So how far are we from there? You know, uh, where are the technology missing pieces? Uh, is that going to you know, incrementally improving deep learning, or are there, are there going to be some other fundamental shift in order to get to the next level? Um, so I believe for the captioning work, you could probably have a, just a much bigger training set and a, possibly a slightly bigger model, and you would actually improve that a lot because the the training, the public training data set from MS Coco was actually not that big. Uh, Sammy was involved in that work, so he, he's sh shaking his head. Um, and I think for more general textual understanding, I think there's still a lot of work to do there. I think we're going to need both some algorithmic and model representation breakthroughs in order to really make good progress on that, as well as kind of the ability to scale things and you know, ingest large amounts of text and, and use that in, in your model to sort of boost the understanding and, and general generalizability of the model. Um, One last question here. Oh. Oh, there's another question here. Go ahead first. Yeah, no. She, sure. Oh, uh, sorry. Okay, so I need to look over here. Okay. Yeah. So, did you compare the performance of uh, TensorFlow in terms of training speed, also compared to the existing scripting framework of deep learning like Torch or Theano and so on? Uh, so, we haven't done a careful comparison because most of our our uh, training is in a distributed setting, and so. Um, but it's sort of, on a single node, it's sort of in the ballpark for most models for comparable to the, a lot of the, because most of those just use the same GPU primitives we're using on the, in a single machine. Um, compared to our old system, uh, uh, TensorFlow is actually a fair bit faster in a distributed setting uh, because we, um, you know, we just, the, the general graph model makes it so you actually have fewer things to, uh, the more time is spent in the inner loops of that system, and you can spend a lot more time sort of focusing on, on making that system perform really well. Whereas disbelief it tended to be a little bit more uh, organic, and the parameter server communication was like a different path than the model level communication. And so uh, it's actually quite a bit faster for training uh, on our big distributed setup than our earlier system. Maybe one last question here. Two quick questions about the residency program. Um, uh, the first being, is this research going to be uh, entirely internal, or are you going to have actual publications coming out of it uh, such? No, no, the, the hope is that we would publish papers in places like NIPS and uh, you know, posting papers on archive and then submitting them to, to top conferences. Wonderful. And then the second thing is, notably absent, is PhD students uh, or people recently we, um, interested? Or? Yeah, so that, that's fine too. We, we yes, <laughs> we, we will not hold a PhD against anyone. <laughs> so be it. Um, with that, I think uh, let's uh, thanks uh, Jeff again.